I'd just like to start by uh, thanking Arthritis Ireland for inviting me to speak here. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to uh, compliment you on the work that you have done over the years uh, and the leadership you have shown in this area, because I think you are real leaders in this area for, for quite some time, uh, despite the uh, inadequacy of funding from the HSE. So, uh, and of course, your, uh, ex your new uh, publication, which I look forward to uh, reading with, with great interest. So the first slide I have just sets out what I think. Uh, the first few slides are just, uh, if you like, the background, uh, as far as the HSE is concerned, to chronic disease management and how we might uh, develop uh, self-management as part of that. So the first slide, uh, I think, uh, sets out what I would say are the four big challenges to all health services anywhere. I think any challenge you can think of fits into one of those four categories. So the first one, of course, is to contain costs, and there's a, a huge focus on that right now because, as you all know, we have lost about three billion uh, in terms of funding over the last four years or so. Uh, the next one is to increase population health outcomes, and so that means we change the focus from inputs and uh, outputs to looking at actually do we make people healthier or do we help people uh, to make themselves healthier. The third one is to ensure that access to healthcare is based on the values of equity, solidarity and inclusion. Uh, and again, I suppose the, the move towards uh, uh, an insurance-based system should uh, help that. Finally, uh, to involve and empower the, the users of services more. And that means uh, not just asking people what they think of their services after they've got them, involving them in planning, but also helping them to help themselves and specifically self-management. So um, the second slide just shows the evolution of um, demography, if you like, the ageing of our population and you're all familiar with it. So just to say that uh, while we are the youngest population in Europe, um, our population is ageing and in particular those over the age of 85 and that you could say is, is, is good news in a way, in a way because more of us uh, despite our high birth rate, uh, we, ha we have an ageing population because more of us are living longer. So, uh, and you, you've all probably heard this before, chronic illness accounts for about 80% of GP consultations, uh, about 60% of hospital beds, and 70%, John said 75, it's there or thereabouts of uh, healthcare costs. And without better management, and specifically self-management, and more prevention, chronic illness will make the health services unsustainable. The British government commissioned a report um, some years ago uh, from an economist, a um, pretty hard-nosed uh, economist, and his name escapes me at the moment, but he made the point uh, about engaging the population, an engaged population, that was one of the scenarios. And he made the point very strongly that without that, and without, specifically without self-management, the health services were, were unsustainable. So that was, uh, that was actually the Wanless report. Uh, this slide here shows um, the improvement in life expectancy in Ireland and in the European Union over the last number of years, back to around 1990. And what has happened is that we have come actually from being below the EU average. You don't see that there because it doesn't go f back far enough. But we're now above the EU average. And in fact, life expectancy is around uh, 83, life expectancy at birth for women and around 78 point something for men. That is a, uh, that's a massive, uh, you know, that's a real success story. We've gained about two and a half to three years life expectancy over the last few decades. Now, of course, uh, what about uh, the quality of life or health status or self-reported health? Well, over half uh, of the extra years are reported to be lived uh, in good health. And that's good news because many of those people have chronic illness and they see, perceive their, their health as being good. So uh, in the HSE, the management of chronic illness is now one of the key uh, driver uh, projects in the health service reform programme. Uh, and a number of clinical programmes have been established led by uh, senior clinicians, and they're developing uh, evidence-based guidelines, protocols and pathways for the management of chronic illness. Now we're just beginning uh, to look at uh, prevention in that context and self-management. There's now a prevention program and um, I, I, I'm, I may be corrected on this but I, I, to my knowledge 
Self-management hasn't featured strongly in most of the clinical programmes. I know there's, there are some uh, elements of work that are, that are being done, uh, and I would hope that will uh, improve in the future. The Department of Health a few years ago published their policy framework for managing chron chronic illness, and they specific, specifically mention uh, the value of um, um, support for self-management. So, um, management of chronic illness requires an overall population health approach, not just a, an overwhelming focus on the treatment of chronic illness, which we tend to have, tended to have, but also preventing it in the first place and helping people themselves uh, to manage it. So, categorising uh, people with chronic illness, 80% have a well-controlled single chronic illness. They're easily managed and can manage themselves um, in, with primary care support. 15% uh, are more complex. Uh, probably more than one condition, but can still manage in, in the community. And then we have 5% uh, with more complex conditions, often associated with, with complications. Now the point is that at all of these stages, self-management is relevant. Obviously it's different. People move through different phases uh, uh, of, uh, of the illness and, and have to, to cope with that and manage that and, and meet the new challenges uh, of each change. Elements of good chronic disease management, and some of these we are trying to implement in the HSE. The use of information systems for both individuals and populations. So for example, for individuals it means that people can be called and recalled uh, for regular visits. Um, that's not uniformly the case. Many GPs do it, and it's being done more and more in hospitals. That helps improve uh, outcomes. Because people often don't even get the message that they have a long-term illness which requires management, if that's not the case. They think it's an episodic thing. I go to the doctor when I get a, a problem and that's it. Uh, identifying people uh, with chronic illness uh, from information systems. Stratifying people by risk so that we can better meet their needs. Involving people in their own care and helping them to, to, as far as possible and as far as they want to do it uh, themselves. Coordinating care using case managers. One of the big problems at the moment is the coordinators of care uh, are often the family or the people themselves. And that's not the kind of empowerment or self-management we want. Uh, we need somebody to coordinate the many inputs and the example I often quote is somebody with uh, Alzheimer's disease whose family has to sort of tell the GP what the public health nurse said and the physiotherapist said and care is just not really uh, well coordinated even in the community, never mind between hospital and community. Using multidisciplinary teams because the evidence is very clear, that's how you get better outcomes. The day of the doctor or any other single health professional doing it all on their own is long run. Integrating specialist and general expertise, integrating care across the boundaries, uh, minimising unnecessary visits and admissions. And the evidence is quite clear about self-management. It does improve healthcare utilisation, helps to make the visits more appropriate, uh, that people can get better value from them and helps reduce admissions to secondary care. And uh, as Kate said, uh, <coughs> helps provide care in the least intensive settings. That's what people want and that's what uh, gives you the best outcomes. So last year the HSE developed a self-management framework, which is a, a guidance document for um, what we need to do on self-management. The first is to engage with key stakeholders which uh, involve um, uh, NGOs, public and patients and so on. And we are doing some of that. We have, for example, engaged with Arthritis Ireland and others uh, about self-management. Training health professionals. And one of the things that I just want to say there is, uh, it seems to me that training of health professionals is, represents a, a big culture change in the health services. Because you're talking about a style of consultation which is very different and I won't say to all health professionals, but it's, it's a bit alien to some health professionals. It's, it's a really big challenge. Um, and many health professionals do what they think is best. They do try and they feel that they are helping people to manage. But what we need to do is give them a structure uh, so that they can do this much better. And many of them do actually want to do it. Uh, develop care pathways. And the point there is that self-management needs to be part of all care pathways for long-term illness. Uh, contracts and service level agreements. We have contracts with many people and service level agreements with many organisations. Um, and what um, <coughs> it has been suggested that we should, you know, write in self management there 
and incentivize people, uh, organizations to do this. Now, most of you know we're probably not uh, at the moment uh, in a position to, as it were, give NGOs more money. Uh, but it has been suggested to us that in some way, through those contracts, we could acknowledge the work done by NGOs. I'm not quite sure how we should do that, and I'd be interested in your, in your views, but I have raised it with the head of contracts uh, in the HSE, so if you have any views about that, I'd be interested in hearing them. Uh, adopt the Stanford uh, peer-led model, and we are uh, implementing it on a pilot basis in two areas, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we have mapped and profiled the uh, peer-led services that are being given by NGOs. Many of them are doing self-management after a fashion, not necessarily uh, the Stanford way, but you know they are doing something about empowering patients uh, and, and people as they see it. Uh, we have an A to Z, which I'll talk about, uh, of diseases and conditions, which I'll talk about briefly in a, in a few minutes, uh, aimed at helping and improving self-literacy. Uh, and we have developed uh, patient empowerment <coughs> resources. Uh, one of them is uh, called Is It Safe to Ask? And uh, we have somebody from that area of the HSE here who might like to... Um, uh, just say something about that later on, and develop an evaluation framework. So, uh, the initiatives we have at the moment, the Donegal Quality of Life program, um, and John Hayes, the manager uh, is of, the, of that program, uh, manage, the manager of the um, area where that program has been run is here. The Tala Hospital um, peer-led program, which, is being, uh, which was developed in the hospital, led by the hospital, but actually it is a community uh, program uh, on the Stanford model. Uh, the expert patient program for diabetes, which is not quite the same as this, but uh, it's uh, led, as I understand, by nutritionists, so sp and specifically for diabetes. Uh, then evaluation of an online G uh, ICGP training program on self-management among health professions in Donegal. And finally, some other initiatives, uh, which are not very systematic. They, they're, I, th I think they're very much dependent on the particular clinicians who are leading or uh, implementing this. So just quickly uh, to mention the um, Donegal Quality of Life Programme, that's what they call it, um, which is based on the Stanford model. And this is being done in the context of a wider chronic disease uh, management programme, which spans the hospital and the community. So I think you've seen uh, all of these indicators before, and uh, an evaluation at, a, at an early stage of this has shown improvements in those indicators you see there, self-efficacy, levels of fatigue, communication with the GP, health distress, ability to do tasks at home, and relationships with the family. Um, benefits um, seen by the people who are participating, positive attitude, eating healthily, taking more exercise, increased self-confidence, no longer feeling alone, 95% would recommend the program to others. Now, so far, 550 people have gone through this course and there are 26 trainers, as, as I understand. Uh, so this is another one, Tala Hospital in Dublin. 138 people have uh, completed this programme, and 72 have participated in a pre- and post-evaluation. Uh, Most common illnesses, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, MS, and arthritis. And again, improvements in self-efficacy, managing illness in general, exercise, uh, getting information on illness, communication with the doctor, positive health behaviour, um, and positive trends in obtaining health, <coughs> social and recreational activity, healthcare utilisation, and health status. So that's a very quick run through the, um, uh, the findings of those two uh, evaluations. Uh, the other one I just want to talk about briefly and very briefly, uh, training for frontline staff uh, in the HSE, because I as I mentioned earlier, People do need training in this. They, they need uh, an approach, a framework uh, to, to help them do it. Um, the ICGP has developed a, a, an online training course for its senior uh, registrars um, in general practice. And we are working with the ICGP to pilot that online course uh, in, in the HSC among um, a group of health professionals in Donegal. Now the importance of an online course at the HSE, of course, is that it takes less time. And we are finding huge difficulty in having staff released for all kinds of really important programs. Health and safety, um, brief interventions for um, smoking cessation, which I am trying to drive and 
a little bit frustrated with at times, um, hand hygiene even at times. So uh, an online course we would hope would help us get over that. Uh, we don't know if it really impart, if we'd really be able to impart the skills as well as the knowledge through this, but that's one of the things we want to find out. And the other things we want to find out is, uh, is it suitable for our staff as well as for um, uh, general practitioners? Um, um, so that's being evaluated at the moment, and it'll take uh, another few months at least before we have the results of that. If that doesn't prove suitable, I don't know if it will. Um, we've got to look and see what we can do. We have the facility in-house uh, to, to uh, uh, develop training programs and do um, uh, um, to, to video sessions. So we could do that. Uh, I would like to think that this might be helpful in some way. Um, this is the HSE HZ, and this is, as I mentioned, an HZ of diseases and conditions, um, about 700 conditions. I think this uh, helps empower people, uh, helps improve self-literacy. I don't want to overstate its value in terms of self-management because, you know, in itself it's not self-management. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing to have. And um, we heard earlier about the independent information seekers. We have to... Um, uh, facilitate and, and help people to do that with reliable evidence-based information. And I should say this is, we, we got this um, content from the HSE, but we have it from the NHS, I should say, and we have adapted it uh, for, for uh, to be appropriate for clinical practice in Ireland. So wider implementation of self-management in the HSE. Uh, it's a big challenge to get anything, as it were, new uh, in, in, uh, into the HSE. Um, you, you would argue, and I would argue, from the data I presented initially, that we can't afford not to do this, that health services will be unsustainable unless we engage significant <coughs> proportions of the population uh, in prevention and in, as far as possible, and in managing uh, their own illness. But through the clinical programmes, where I think where we, we do expect to get self-management as part of all these healthcare pathways, to, through training health professionals, and by looking to see what we can do in the community, I'm just not quite sure about that. I would hope that we will make further progress uh, in, in the next couple of years, but uh, we are at a very early stage of this, um, and I, I don't pretend that, um, you know, we have, um, I'm not pretending that we've done a huge amount here. Uh, a lot remains to be done. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>